abbreviate it as it has. Okay, got it. And uh, recorded in progress. Great. Uh, so we work with the uh, with your German Columbia Pins Institute to build and disseminate spaces that uh, discuss pressing issues about the ongoing peace building process that um is ongoing, of course, um, and above all um, after the singing of the Colombian Peace Accords 2016 that aimed to end um, a very long conflict of over five decades between the FARC and the Colombian state. Um, our current challenge, and from now on, will be to make the final report of this commission known and to generate education and pedagogy um, with the ends of reaching truth and non-repetition. Therefore, we have organized this very first panel as part of the um, German group, uh, where academia and civil society need to reflect upon the work and the actions of this um, Truth Commission. So my name is Daniela Forero, member of this group and master student in Peace and Conflict Studies. And I will be moderating this space together with Nicole Olsen, uh, who's also a member of this group and a master in democratic governance and civil society. Um, so let me quickly introduce you to our panelists of today before we get started. Um, so I'll first go with Juli Cassiani. Um, she has 13 years of experience in the NGO sector and a huge, huge passion for the defense of human rights, peace building, and shaping the world. Uh, she's currently working at by a WOC, that's probably first intersectional co-working space for Black, Indigenous, and women of color. Um, Claudia Lozano is a sociologist from the University of Buenos Aires and has a PhD in philosophy specializing in Latin American studies from the Free University of Berlin. She's currently researcher and teaching fellow of the Equal Chances for Women program of the University uh, of the Humboldt University at Berlin. And she's also lecturer at the Latin American Institute of the Free University of Berlin. Uh, we also have as third panelist, Natalia Sanchez, doctor in education from University of Los Andes in Colombia and associate professor at the University of La Salle. Um, she's currently a researcher at the Claxo funded project entitled Feminist Peace and Economists in Recovery with Gender Equality and Climate Justice, a Colombian approach. Uh, and we had a slight change in our panel and are going to be um, welcoming Maria Cárdenas as our uh, fourth panelist. She's currently lecturer at the Sociology Institute of the Justus Liebig University at Gießen. And since 2020, she's research associate for bridges, um, building inclusive societies, diversifying knowledge, and tackling discrimination through civil society participation in universities. So um, thank you for joining us um, to our panel and to you. I'll give the floor to Nicole. Thank you, Daniela. So I will explain now for everyone who is joining the panel. How is how will we proceed? So we will divide. Uh, we have decided to divide this panel in three big sections. Uh, in the first section, we will deal with the motivation that brought us here behind this discussion, and the main concept the main concept that we will discuss throughout the panel, which is intersectionality. Uh, the second section, we will discuss the need of an intersectional approach uh, to peace building and reconciliation. Uh, and in the third section, we will try to come up with possible questions to these answers. So we'll be pointing some specific questions to our panelists, how we can translate intersectionality into practice and what are future challenges after the end of the True Commission mandate, which is uh, happening like on the 28th of June, the True Commission will deliver the final report. Uh, and in the final part of the panel, uh, we will open the room for questions from the audience and we, we will conclude. Uh, we want to inform you that you can write your questions in the chat at any moment, uh, but we'll post them at the end of the panel. Or if you want, you can also write them. And then at the end, you can, if you want to extend in your question, you can expose it uh, at the end of the panel and, and yeah, go deeper and personally with the question and to the panelists that you want to ask. So to start, uh, I, will, uh, I will say the motivation that brought us here, many motivations, but let's say that our main motivation for organizing this panel is to share the work, the experience and the legacy of the True Commission. 
meaning that even though the commission has done a lot of steps in collecting testimonials and uh, a lot of steps toward the achievement of true and not repetition, uh, we are still in a context that we cannot necessarily speak about uh, post-conflict, but rather post-accords. And uh, especially when we think about the four years back uh, that we, would pro we did probably not have a government that was accompanied implementations, uh, but hopefully we will have uh, a, a new way to bring these narratives and a new way to, to know what, what as, a, as a country we have gone through and what can we achieve in terms of future uh, for like the communities, but also as, as, a, as a country, as, as, as Colombians and also as internationals, we, we, we also organize this panel to get uh, through more audience, students, uh, civil society, academy, to discuss and share the word of the true commissions. Uh, through the panel, we would like to draw a special attention to the methodology and the importance of the commission final report being this material like the result of, of the final board of the true commission, but knowing that there are still a lot of things to do and future uh, challenges that we as a society, we will have to encounter. So now I would like to give the floor to Aniela. Thank you for the introduction and for underlying our um, motivation behind it. So speaking um, of methodology, um, the Columbian Truth Commission has acknowledged the necessity of implementing a differential approach that manages to recognize the particularities, the different impacts that the different groups of people in Colombia um, have faced throughout the conflict based on gender, ethnicity, um, and different categories we, uh, which we are going to be speaking about uh, throughout the panel. Uh, one of the underlying aims of this discussion is therefore to explore the concept of intersectionality, uh, of course applied to the Colombian context and regarding it as a methodological tool to identify this overlapping uh, between the different forms of discrimination. So let's give the floor to our panelists. Um, we would like you to tell us a little bit more about your personal definition of this so-called ethnic approach, gender approach, and of course, in a broader sense, the concept of intersectionality. So what do we exactly mean in terms of, of theory and concrete actions? And how can we translate this theoretical framework into, into practice? Um, we, could be, uh, we could start with, uh, with Natalia, if that's okay with you. I'm just going in the order I have in my, in my screen. Um, so the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Hey, everyone. Um, well, as you said before, my name is Natalia Sanchez, and I'm a university professor in Colombia. I'm also a feminist who discusses post-colonial approaches to topics such as peace and gender studies. Uh, well, in answering your question by ethnic and gender approaches, we mean this relatively new idea among academy and the state that different people experience war, violence, and even peace in different ways. In recognizing this, the idea is to sharpen the lens academy uses to understand others or the other, to understand what has happened to them in particular, because these groups have been suffering structural violences far more critical than the ones we tend to describe when only talking about war in general. This way of understanding is also very useful in the state because it helps to design specific policy for specific people. When talking about intersectionality, we expect to realize that these oppressions are intersected, that people are victim of larger webs of injustice because they experience more than one form of oppression. This is the case of African-American women who are the ones who gave us the term. Intersectionality, intersectionality, first coined by Kimberly Crenshaw and then further developed by Patricia Hill Collins. It is a very useful theoretical framework to explain injustice. It is thought to be a critical social theory by which to understand how these intersecting injustices are produced and have real effects on people's lives. Besides its academic use, it's been put into action by a lot of activists, especially in the US, to communicate with the state, to explain to the judicial system how a law or rule or institution 
is differentiality is differentially is differentially affecting a community. The problem is the translation of it or the intention to translate this idea and the idea that the politics realm should be a translation of the academic realm or that movements everywhere should take up on such tools because they have worked before in a different space. I think there is much to learn from this perspective. It is a very powerful descriptive tool. It even works as a way for the state to recognize injustice and differences. But in the words of Ochi Curiel, which is a very important academic activist here in Colombia, but she's a Dominican uh, uh, woman, the question before us is, what is the political project here with intersectionality? Whose project is this? And how it articulates political struggles for communities elsewhere? I think that's like my point when talking about intersectionality. And I think it is, as I said, a very powerful descriptive tool for academics, but I don't know, and this is what I would like to bring to the panel, the question about the political project behind it. Thank you very much. And we will have the, the chance to problematize a little bit um, the concept as well and to regard it uh, critically. Um, so I would give the floor to Claudia. You can uh, go on with your thoughts on the concept and um, your insights. J you're muted. Um, now it should, oh. Now, can now, you hear me? Now we hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I would like to stay in the idea of translation. I like it very much when you made your presentation, Natalia. Um, I'm not now in the academic world. I am more, I turn to the psychoanalysis. And there is one thing it's, which is very, very important in psychoanalysis that everyone has a truth. Everyone has his own truth. And this builds what we call in psychoanalysis, the nucleus of stone, which is very important to discover. There are lots of discourses, there are lots of linguistic tricks, there are lots of ways of talking about the self, about the, the, our own truth. And I think intersectionality takes care about that because we want people to tell us the truth, the truth they have inside. And when you have suffered violence and it goes about, and we have to look about the truth, which is behind the violence, because when they use violence, they stop talking. There is no possibility com to communicate. So we want to know which truth had to be canceled, could not come to the surface and to be talked about and to get into dialogues in different places, in different places in society, in different regions of Colombia, where people live and experience violence very differently. If we take a household, no, no matter where, in Africa, in Latin America, in Argentina, where I come from, where the processes of violence are very close to those of Colombia, but Colombia has something that has impressed me very much, they, we just listened to that, 9 million of people were affected by those processes. So we have 9 million of truth and we have 9 million of responsibilities. How does this come to discourse? How does this will be understood by judges, by liars? That is what impressed me, the work which is, has to be done. And who understands us? Who translates that? what people are talking about or how they experience violence in different ways in different regions of Colombia. I think that intersectionality shows us that people have speak from different positions as a woman, as men, as people of different ages, as people of different racial, ethnic, um, class origins. And that there is a very, very complex, um, there is no, no, no light solution to find. We have to listen. We have to listen to the, to, the, to the ways people construct their truth and we have to give them place 
We have to keep create the spaces where they can talk about them. Why? Because here, when we are talking about uh, the intersectionality, we also have to, to, to deal with discrimination. And ethnic groups in Colombia, like in many places of this world, have been suffering discrimination within processes or long time processes. So they, they have been canceled, their culture has been canceled. And I think that intersectionality shows us or um, um, gives us the chance and a gender approach to open up new spaces where people can talk about their truth, about the way they relate to the violence in the past and in the present and how to stop those processes. What do they feel it will be um, justice for them? How do they imagine peacefully processes of understanding? What do they need to tell their truth? That's what I would like to say. Thank you very much. Um, I would go on with Maria, if that's okay for you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Um, there was already so much uh, important um, stuff that has been said. I think <laughs> we, we remain short because probably most of the points that we wanted to say have already been said. Um, but uh, yeah, so I agree very much with uh, Natalia and Claudia, and I think uh, you've raised very, very important points to which I can only like agree. I think um, maybe what I would like to say about uh, intersectionality, uh, one example that I liked, uh, which is from Grada Quilomba is, is about, well, which I would then, uh, which we could apply to the Colombian context would be, um, Many of you or some of you will know about um, this um, this uh, case where this Embera girl, the 12 year old, was uh, raped by 12 uh, by six um, um, Colombian soldiers. And uh, what Gray Quilomba would ask um, would be like, would this happen to a girl which is not from the rural? Would this also happen to a boy? Would this happen to a white urban girl? Would this happen? to um, um, an upper class um, boy or girl. And I think um, this is these questions, I think are very good to understand intersectionality because depending our, on our answers, we understand how race, gender and class are intersected and create specific forms of, of, um, yeah, of, of vulnerability to violence and also different forms of discrimination that are very particular, like um, in terms of the Colombian uh, armed conflict, it would be the rapeability, for example, that's a term that Julia Saxeda has pointed um, of, um, she talks about Afro-Colombian women, but we can for sure also include uh, indigenous women in this case. And, um, and I think, so So this I think is, is, a, is a practical way of understanding intersectionality, which sometimes is a little bit hard for people to grasp. Um, I think it's important to, to, when we talk about violence, to have also like a broader understanding of violence when we discuss intersectionality, because uh, one thing is um, physical violence, armed violence, but the other one which interacts uh, closely with it would be for structural violence, violence, which Claudia has already mentioned, but also epistemic violence, that is the violence produced through knowledge, for example, um, that we should question ourselves, like who is part of the peace building institutions right now, um, who is part of the knowledge production process, and how is intersectional violence reproduced there? Um, but also, and I think um, that is also important, what is not only, um, I think also it was Claudia talked about the, the truth um, that are in plural, that are neglected or are being told and also the, the truth we'd like to hear. And I think this is a very important point. And in this sense, I would like to address the ethnic approach and remind us that the ethnic approach is not so much a result of because Colombia, uh, in a moment of happiness decided that an ethnic approach was, was a good idea, but it was a result of a struggle of um, ethnic activists in Colombia 
to have an ethnic chapter included into the peace agreement. And um, that was a result because the ethnic commission, they wanted to have it from the beginning, from, from when the peace negotiations started, um, when it been taken seriously by the negotiation parties. So I think it's important also for us to understand that the ethnic approach we have today is thanks to um, these activists um, being very persistent and um, to also recognize that um, I think not only in Colombia, but everywhere worldwide, um, having an approach towards gender or towards peace that um, in, that uh, transversalizes an anti-racist perspective um, is, is still, I think, a long way to go. I think with Colombia is a good way to start. And I think um, we've done, there is this an amazing job that has been done already, but I think there is still a long way to go. Indeed. <laughs> um, thank you for your insight. And uh, we'll just end with uh, Julia and your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I also agree with each of you. I think that we basically mentioned everything, but I think that uh, when we come to talk about intersectionality, I think that we have many topics to address, actually. And I want to bring to the conversation about the BIPOC, um, FLINTA, and all these um, acronyms that we had, but that also explain something. And I really like, uh, as Claudia said, um, say that she, when we talk about true, we have different perspective and we have different roots. So I think that, um, and when I talk about the Colombian process, I know that when we talk about violence, we basically, or mainly we, um, we discuss about the, the war and what happened to Colombia, but I also want to talk, and I think that we, uh, in this le um, the last months, I think, and the last year, we are also talking about the normative violence. Because before then, this moment, we were always addressing the war, I mean, the when the guerrillas and um, the difficulties that, that had the population um, in the farms, but also in the cities. But also we didn't discuss about uh, the, 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 um, the, the, I would say the difficulties that had um, LGBTQ people, but also the BIPOC to access to um, the system or to the institutions. And that is, I, I like it what you say, Maria, because actually that's something that I, even though when we were just building, and I say we were building because I think that this is something that is from all Colombians somehow, the agreement, but when we were building this agreement, um, we have to fight for getting a spot in that process. And that is insane because when we talk about conflict, we, we have to understand that basically it's not the only place but the violence in the, the black communities, the BIPOC communities is not, is not the same as it was in the city. It was, there was more cruel, um, it was more cruel. It was, um, uh, I was, they were even more intense. And just the fact that we have to discuss this and we have to, I, I won't even say this because we have to prove that we need to be on the table is one of the reasons that we need to discuss this because continually we are just fighting to be on the table and we cannot even address deeply about this situation because we have to, uh, the whole time of conversation, uh, it goes that why if we have to be there and if we have, I mean, we don't have to. And I think that that's one of the reasons about, uh, we have to discuss, um, discuss about normative violence that it has been for many years happening in Colombia and even now, when we are trying to discuss about the implementation. I will, it comes to BIPOC, um, I will say that it not just about um, even sit down, uh, sit down in the table, but also about the possibility that we have to take decisions. I mean, about the real power, because it's not just to having women, black, indigenous, or um, gay, lesbian sit down in the table. What, what are we allowed to do? And that is something that I always want to address because as I say, we um, mainly are discussing about if we can sit down at the table, but we are not discussing what we are allowed to do. Do we have real power? Do we, do, uh, are we really um, stakeholders? Uh, um, and even how is um, understand um, this process? Um, and I like it, what Maria say about the epistemic violence because it's not just, our, um, it just not, about if we can sit down and what can we do, but if we go further than that, we can also understand that is um, how we do it. 
And that is also important because the way of doing is not the way, it's not the same. For BIPOC, we have different ways to understand stuff, to understand the processes. Um, we have this a standard way to do um, things, even knowledge, even, I, I would say reports, even meetings, and we have to adjust to that way. And we not are always allowed to bring all that we want to because we don't have the same way to do it. And I will explain it and I will just short this um, and close this speech or this, um, this moment saying that it's like we, ha we have like different languages. Even though if I know a few words, it won't be the same because I don't have the ability, the capacity to bring all that information to the table as the same as the others. And that's what we have to discuss. And I think that we are um, somehow we are so short-sighted. I mean, we cannot just look forward and, and forward because we are going in these topics with so, uh, I don't know even how to address it because I don't want to uh, say uh, incorrect word, but uh, we always walk so soft about this that we are not even going to the main point. And we have to discuss that. It cannot be the same always and always. And it's really, I would say funny, or I would say comic, because we are, I think that we are in the decade of the black community. We are talking, the, the UNESCO, the, the UN are talking about the, the slavery route. We are trying to understand the, the colonization. But I still, even though we have few years talking about this, we are in the same point. We haven't moved forward, not that much. And if we are doing, and we are in that situation, even when we are trying to bring this topic to the table in the, um, in the, in the war, not just Colombia, what will happen after? And I think that that's why we still need to discuss this because we are not really going to the main point. We are just being very soft. I will say very polite about this. Um, I say that I would close my speech, but it comes to my mind. Um, there is um, an author that I really love, and she say that even when we talk about BIPOC, we are not even allowed to express feelings because when we express feelings is, I know this is just rage, this is you are just anger. But why is not possible when we have been through so much processes and when you are um, passionate, let's say passionate, when you are passionate about something, that's understood about that. Uh, I, I would say that it's read as you are not rational. And it's not true. I mean, as I say, they are not just about who are sitting on the table, but uh, what power do we have, but also the way we have to do it. And we are always the same that has to um, just acknowledge that and just fit to that, like stick to that. And when we will talk about this, I mean, when we will just go forth on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Holly. Um, I'll give you back the word, uh, Nicole. Well, that was a very nice way to start. And I think that now that all of us, we had a more concrete idea about what we meant and what exactly intersectionality means, uh, we will move on, on to be more focused on the Colombian case, right? And I would like to go with Julio in this one. Uh, so we are we considering the, the specific affection that, for example, women from indigenous communities, but also from Black, Afro-Colombian, Raizal, Palenquero, which uh, we, we cannot, I cannot translate and third, but uh, are like different communities in Colombia. Uh, considering the specific violence that they have suffered, why is essential not to only have the ethnic approach, but also the intersectionality lenses to address them, to address the violence and the and to address also the future challenges that we will face in the in the after the post draft of the of the true commission final report. Yeah, I will go softly and then I will go to the point, but I will say that the first reason why we have to talk about this is because we need to recognize that um, both a strength and, um, and diversity, I would say the multiculturalism and diversity is an strength and is also an opportunity. And that would say that, that would be like my main statement um, in order 
Because I think that when we talk about intersectionality, it, feel like, it feels like it's an obligation and it's just a quote. And I think that we have to, uh, if we say, if we see that in a different way, we will just change the way that we read this. Let me we go through this. But I'm going to the Colombian case. Um, I will see, I will say that when we talk about ethnicity um, in this process of implementation, but also in the process that that will come after that the, the true commission delivered the report. I think that when we just try to understand what the communities are and what they need, that will allow us to empower communities and also to let communities to have an ownership about that information. And I don't know if that is completely clear, so I will just break it in pieces. But when I say about, when I talk about ownership, I talk about the fact that it just not can, it cannot just feel about that this is an information that we just got it. We just have to feel that this is ours. And the way to feel like ours, we have to break it down and make, it, make that in our own way. I don't know if that is completely clear, but I, what I mean is that it, this cannot be just others too. It has to be mine. But in order to be mine, I have to understand it and doing in my own way of doing it, yeah? And that is why it's important to um, bring together intersectionality because it not just see gender, but also see ethnicity, also see territoriality because it's not the same to talk about this process. Uh, I would say in Bogota that in, um, in Amazonia or the Pacific or Chocó, Cali, Cartagena is different and it has the right to be different. And it has to be built in the same, um, in the land. I mean, and that's something that I really, uh, I, I really like about the, the report that I hope to be like that. But so far what I have, uh, I have been reading is that the fact that we have to just break in the way that the people that are taking the information can just make in their own way. I mean, they can just make it for themselves. And that will, I, I think that that will, uh, that will impact directly in um, with reduction of inequalities, because when you can read the things in your own language, you would just understand that you would just acknowledge and you would just move forward. But I just take, uh, I took a, um, a couple notes about the report and about the implementation that I want to share with you, because I think that that is specific for the Colombian case. And I think that that's very um, important from different processes, like peace processes, because in Colombia, I think that with the implementation, I mean, it's not perfect, obviously it's not. We have many challenges and many tax, but I think that in this process and in the implementation, um, we really recognize uh, individual and cultural differences, and that's important. I mean, it's not the same to be talking about even Palenque and the Pacifico, we are bad, we are both black, but we are, we are not the same. We understand, we have, um, I would say that we have similarities, but we are, we are not the same. Um, but also I would say that when we target the community as a role, I mean, when we, when we understand that the community has a role, like real power, that's, that, that is important. Because as I say before, um, it, this is not just saying that we have to take the report or the implementation, it has to be, and I will say something that is, it sounds very uh, odd, um, but we cannot just do it in the Bogota way. We have to do it in our own way. That's the way it should be. Um, also when, because I see, I think that that also build trust. And that's important because I think that sometimes we feel that we are just achieving uh, a goal that we are just, uh, yes, we are just trying to get the result, but we don't think that this is just more than a process. I mean, communities will stay there. And if we want to really build like really, really development, we have to think about this process. It is just like, a, I would say, um, opportunity to build communities that, that um, that skill will stay there, but I would have to go further than that because um, I would say the implementation covers few of the pro the, uh, of the difficulties that we have, but it, not, it, doesn't cover, it doesn't cover everything, I would rather say. 
Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that, um, and I think that that's important in this process, and we really have to take um, account of this, is that um, we have to reflect honor and respect when we go to communities. And that, no, that doesn't happen all the time. I don't know if that is completely clear, but uh, when we are in communities, sometimes we feel that um, even when you're participating in projects, we feel that the people is just going with this idea that they know everything and they are going to the communities. And sometimes I would say in this really rude way that we feel like we are a zoo. I mean, we are a zoological, like a zoological zoo because the way that they approach to us is that you are not able to understand, you are not able to build anything, you just have to receive it and we are here to help you to do it. And, uh, and, and even don't like the, the word help because you are not helping me, that is so vertical. Um, we are building together. So that's, I think that the intersectionality brings that to the table and discuss this, how we do it. And I think that we have for sure a really long way to do it, but um, we are still discussing this. Thank you, Juli. Um, well, the next question that, but that we were um, that 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 we wanted to uh, to ask you, but somehow has been already answered by all of you in the introduction, uh, was how does the categorization of different social factors such as gender, ethnicity, territory, class, and so on and so on, can facilitate but also hinder uh, peace building in the current Colombian scenario? Uh, if you can give like some concrete examples based on your experience and on your research, I would like to add to Natalia and to Maria in this question. Should I go first again or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I think um, this um, is the result as um, Uli was just saying of fighting for the state's recognition, you know? And this, is, this has been important in this uh, peace agreement for a lot of different groups. I mean, um, fighting for the state's recognition of the ability of communities and specific groups to um, uh, sit on the table and to be uh, taken into account is it's, it's very important and it works in some ways, but it is, very problematic in others. And I'll use an example to explain why I think it, it can work both ways. Um, I will talk about my experience as a researcher and in from my point of view as a, as a, a researcher from Bogota and academic, you know, and all the difficulties that, that comes with it, you know, but okay. We recently finished um, working on a research project on rural women, especially trying to understand this category, rural women, under the amplifying lens that came up uh, with the peace accord, with the peace agreement. Um, we as a group realized that this category, rural women, worked uh, for women's organizations across the country to be seen by the state and by international agencies as well. <laughs> they were summoned to participate in the rural women policy design and to take part in the rural reform point of the peace agreement and in a lot of different other uh, public places and, and, and spaces. It gave them a platform to be seen and to be asked about differential positions on war, development and peace. But this platform is based on their description as, an, as the eternal victims of everything, as we call them, the global South Cinderella's. I mean, the ones that are helpless and need to be saved. They are recognized as victims of a threefold discrimination as women, as rural, and as victims of the armed conflict. And as such are intervened, this description of them as the victims of everything has been used to define the tools for the state and the international agencies to intervene their bodies, their territories, their land, and their lives. Always with the idea of development 
that may be not be their own idea of development. Because most of the time, being seen as an absence of or as an empty space is the key element that facilitates other to intervene with that colonial gaze that has reproduced violence throughout our history. So if you ask me, identity politics has been useful to be seen by the state, to be incorporated in its logics, to be recognized. The problems arise when this recognition becomes another way of inflicting violence to groups that have already been marginalized or helps build the kind of political and economic projects that they have been fighting against their whole lives. In the case of peasants or the peasant movement in Colombia, which is the one I've been studying in the last years, this is exactly what has been going on. Their struggle for land rights, for seats, for water, and fair prices has been dissected. And the rural women category used to divide an identity struggle that has been silenced and repressed. I mean, this is why I think it is important to use these kind of theoretical tools to describe, but then also it's important to analyze the complexities of using these kind of tools as the, state, um, the state's way to um, treat differences and also the historical struggles that are within the territory. Thank you, Natalia and Maria. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. You can also very much relate with Natalia again. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, because you were asking whether these categories can facilitate or hinder, I think first and foremost, I think we need to recognize that uh, these uh, categorizations are a reality. So they have material consequences on the people. So it's not so much whether we would like to uh, um, whether we think it's an it's a good instrument to make visible something, but they already exist. They already have an impact on people's lives, and both on their opportunities and on the forms of violence they encounter in their lives. Um, and these categories hierarchize people, so they hierarchize their access to institutions. Uh, Huli has already said it before as well, and I think. So if we do not um, consider these categories, then we repeat violence and we ignore this kind of knowledge that we already have that, that this actually has an, has an effect. Um, and I think if, as long as we ignore uh, how these categories uh, affect um, people's lives and interpolate with war or interpolate with power, um, we can we cannot construct we cannot build peace so um i think this is a central question in terms of uh what is today our topic that is like um the work of the truth commission but also uh, peace building more generally so i think um we would we should ask ourselves for example how would and would it how would it work and where would it happen and who would be affected by that for example so we then then we see that actually there is uh, there is such a close connection um, that that we need that in order to actually be able to uh, and I think one of the reasons why the Colombian conflict has remained so difficult to be resolved is because certain aspects um, have never been touched. I, I mean, Huli also has said it before. Uh, the, um, for example, capitalism and its and its effects or its connection with uh, extractivism, and extractivism and the armed conflict, for example, is a topic that I think we need to address if we really want to take seriously peace building. Um, so, yeah, I've come a little bit away from the categorization part, <laughs> um, but I think uh, in terms of categorization, I think it helps us to also think about our. Um, our standpoint um, about uh, where we're situated and what this means in terms of the knowledge we are able to acquire. And this means both that um, we, can, um, uh, we can give credit to um, those people, as Natalia has already mentioned, that are categorized, for example, as um, 
the rural women victim um, it can lead to a pathologization even of people but it can also if we think about knowledge then we can also understand that they, they are not only passive but they have actually enormous knowledge about the armed conflict that we could take seriously and um, and also become aware of our own ignorance as people who have not um, been affected directly by certain forms of ignorant uh, of violence and um, yes maybe so far yeah okay thank you um, I will totally just conclude this section uh, if I maybe can. just sorry sorry maybe just if I can add something I think it's very important not to confuse categorization and identity because one thing is that people are categorized in a certain way and along categories such as gender and race or class or um, or affected ter by territory. But this we cannot confuse this with identity. And I think it's important to make this differentiation too. This doesn't mean that people are, should be representative to other people only because they are members of the same categorization group. Thank you, and so important. So yeah, as, as I was saying, we will conclude this 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 first big session by saying that what we can take from this segment is that intersectionality, yeah, it is a good approach and like a, a good lenses to see different types of violence, meaning that, and also meaning that there are different types of violence. That this is structural, but it's also epistemic, epistemic, and it's also cultural, and so on. Uh, and in the Colombian case, it, it's uh, also a good way to see how different people being these uh, transsexuals, lesbians, black, indigenous, and so on, uh, can experience different ways of violence. But at the same time, it's also a category that uh, we need to have a critical assessment and not, uh, yeah, like, I, I think that from the point of Natalia and, Mari and Maria and Juli are like very decolonial in their, their perspective and like not to reproduce these languages and keep categorizing, categorize, categorizing or categorize, categorizing people on them. Uh, I will move also because of time <laughs> to the next uh, section. I will give the word to Daniela. So great, um, thank you. Uh, so in this last section, uh, we would like to bring a little bit the debate on this need for an intersectional approach to, to the more practical terms. Um, and our question um, in, in this part would be how to implement this approach and understand which, which historical, sociocultural, political elements um, still hinder this, like this implementation in real terms, um, as Huli just mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago and also to propose future scenarios uh, and venues that could help us to build a more durable and inclusive space as we all dream of, I guess. Uh, and before beginning with this, I would like to, um, on behalf of the, of the support group uh, of the Truth Commission to draw attention to how the Truth Commission itself has, has worked um, so far to understand the dynamics of the conflict, but also to formulate recommendations that we're going to be seeing, um, that are going to be seen um, throughout the, um, the, the final report. So the Truth Commission has been working jointly with different support groups um, in the Americas and Europe. Uh, and since 2019, the support group in Germany, so the organizers of, of this panel discussion um, was funded with uh, five general and initial objectives. Uh, one of them was the gathering of testimonies for the commission's final report. Uh, we also wanted to acknowledge the victims of the conflict that live in Germany uh, and make their struggles index how visible. Uh, we uh, also intended to raise awareness for the work of the Truth Commission in Germany to contribute to, to, to truth telling and uh, to memory. And of course, and perhaps through this event to sensitize the German civil society regarding the Colombian armed conflict, but also regarding the, the peace building process that um, is still ongoing. Uh, and to this end, we have gathered around 70 testimonies from victims and uh, delivered a series of workshops with victims of the conflict. Uh, we have organized panel discussions, online events, 
and uh, little dialogue spaces to discuss um, on issues of the Colombian context. And we also launched a podcast with several episodes, which we, of course, encourage you to listen to. Um, and these actions have been executed jointly. So uh, as, as a whole group with a common goal of contributing to an inclusive peace from, from abroad. And just to quickly add on that, um, together with other groups, uh, because it's not just a group in Germany, but um, in, in Europe as a whole, um, a new space has emerged, uh, which brings together women, people with different sexual identities and orientations, for instance, trans and non-binary people to address gender related issues uh, and also to build a network somehow uh, among people living in exile that's called that's hard to define in uh, in english but it's co called the internodal de genero like aiming to bring this this little supporting groups together uh, with a gender approach um so I'll give you quickly the, the, the word back, Nicole, uh, because you have a very concrete question to, to Huli, who's also a member of, of, the, of the German support group. So go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Huli, you were saying, and if I got you right, that we, we and when you speak about we, I guess you mean like, uh, the Afro-Colombian people and the Afro communities and women that we need to make the true our own. So uh, the True Commission mainly rely on oral sources to collect the testimonies uh, from the people, but however, these are mainly translated into written statements, no? Like we will have a final draft report we still don't, we also have a transmedia, but we still don't know very much how the report will look like. We know there are some chapters, but this will be a written report. However, what uh, like the academia and what also international standards uh, often say and recommend is like we should, as the way that we should have a culturally appropriate methods to document the experience, we should also have like appropriate methods to socialize it. How, uh, my question would be, how, how, how do you see how to socialize it, how to, to bring these ideas, to bring these issues of the final report back to the communities? Uh, how do you think they are going to receive it if it's just a written statement? Which way it will be better done to do this process? Okay, um, I, will, I want to say something before then that because I know that the, the main point of this is also talking about intersectionality and the fact that when we talk about intersectionality, we are breaking that point of view, that binary point of view that is just women and this male and, um, and it's also uh, black and, and white. And I think that we also have to go deeper than that. I want to say that I want to clarify that before then, then uh, answer that question because I, um, I want to be, uh, truthful what I believe. So I, when, I think that when we talk about intersectionality and I want to explicitly say it, we are talking about also gender, we are talking about ethnicity, that is race, um, territory, because as I say uh, before, there are different ways of understanding the life and the, uh, the, the community. And even though we are black, um, and that's what I like more, um, I like BIPOC, but I also say Raizales and Palenqueros that they are different Black communities among the Black communities because it's not the same. Um, it's important to make that different because sometimes we want to synthesize everything and that's when we fail. There are things that cannot be synthesized. That's the truth. But also we are talking about big things. We are also talking about Flinta. We are talking also about LGBTQ and I communities about youth and children, because also that's part of the process. And, I'm, and I, I, I want to mention this and I won't take that long because I think that when we talk about the report and the implementation, we just think about something that is so homogeneous that just one thing, and it has to be breaking down in different pieces. Because even when we talk about gender and so, we also have to understand about children and youth because it's like we feel that just the adult people will just take this document, they will read it, they will just sign it, and they will just send back to Bogota. And it's not, it's not, it's not like that if we want that in 20 years, 
we don't have the same process all over again. And I mentioned this because this happened and that's what we are doing in Palenque and from Palenque. Uh, and we have this problem with the, uh, with, and I want to briefly mention this because we have this problem with some cultural um, methods, I will say, and I'm just talking for instance about the, the language. We just lost it because everybody was talking, the, the, the other were talking in the language and then the kids were like, no, you're not allowed to know, uh, to know it. And then they died. And there were just few people with that knowledge. And I think that we don't have, we don't want to repeat that when it comes to the implementation of this report, because I hope that we don't have another war in 20 years that, so we don't have to build another report about this. This has to be the same document that we will use to change, um, to share first the truth, but also to change the story of our, of our communities. But I will also, I want to mention a few more, um, I would say categories um, or other groups, I would say also abilities and disability communities, because that's also not the same. We, we don't really take that into account. We don't even think that much about that, but it's important. And yeah, um, religion even. But yeah, when it comes to this, and I will just be very brief because I took time explaining this, but I really wanted to uh, be explicit about this. Um, I think that when it comes to work with communities, the first thing that we have to understand is that as communities, I know that when we build this report, and that's something that I'm thinking, when these reports are made, we think that everybody has to accept it. But uh, this can be a process. I mean, we, we, we can have people in the communities, and I'm not saying that the truth is, in some time, the truth is subjective, subjective. But in this, when come to this, we will have to understand that people will have to read it, but also feel it. And it can, we can have um, this, what can happen is that maybe the people would accept it or maybe not. And that is a process that is completely possible and is okay. Because when we talk about post-colonial and that's what it happens, we are, I think that sometimes we are so narrow that we just think about things very specifically, but also when we talk about post-colonial, that also means that it's not the others who write my own story. So when we bring this document to communities, we have to understand that communities will read it, dance it, uh, discuss it, because that's, the way, that's one of the ways that we can do it in communities. And that will take time, and that will take allegations also, because the people will feel that perhaps it's not the way it is. But I think that that's the most important with uh, answering your reply, Nicole. Uh, it's just, it's important to have a structure about how to do it, but it's also important to let communities build their own way to do it. If we didn't do it already, we have to let communities think how they want to discuss this implementation. Because, and that's why I don't like to use the word socialization because when we word socialization, it's like, I'm speaking about this. I'm telling you what it is and you have to acknowledge, and that cannot happen. I mean, that could happen, but it's not the idea. Because as I say, even when you bring this document to the communities, the communities will say, I don't think that this is true. So I would just exclude this truth this true that is your truth, is not mine. Um, that's why we have to be very open about this, and we have to also understand that it's okay that to happen. We just have to walk through this together. So I will say that also a great idea, and I do some notes, is also to have like people that have um, recognition from the communities that I think that that was really well done when we write down or when they write it down, I always think about it. Really. But when we, they write down the report, they talk account the communities and they talk with leaders that are acknowledged from the communities and that also helps to open the gate like the gap and I would say close the gap, but I'm also like open a, a way to get into the communities. Um, because naturally, obviously the leaders, um, <laughs> sorry, the switching. Um, obviously the leaders understand how the community works and they will have better proposals to bring that information to the community. And I will say that after that happened, uh, I wrote a few things that are important to have in the communities and also in this intersectionality process and is that 
um, after we have the implementation, when we have the report and when we are doing the implementation, I think it's important to have institutionalized, uh, this work are very hard, mechanisms to ensure the inclusion of the communities. I think that it's important to measure and have reports about how this is continuously um, including the communities because the thing, as I say, we, sometimes we feel that you are just, uh, when the, I don't know, I would say foreigners, the people from outside communities, when they bring information to us, do you just want us to validate it and give it to you and say, it's okay. And you will say, we did it. And you never come back to the communities. You just needed to say that you had the BIPOC community and the LGBTQ community but uh, it's not really, it's not a process. I would say just a step, but it's not a process. And we have to switch that, I would rather say. Um, also, the other two points that I want to bring is that we have to adopt localization strategies. I mean, as I say, every community can be different. It's important to understand that. And we have to acknowledge that also. Um, I think a really good idea also that we have to take uh, into account is that we can bring together these minorities groups, such LGBTQ and BIPOC. I mean, we have things that we, I mean, we can basically work together because somehow the feeling of feeling excludes make us feeling together to each other. And we can have like, com like common agendas. And that's also important because sometimes we want to exchange experience with other communities and with other groups. And that also helps. Thank you, Juli. Uh, Maria, you have a uh, short words on that that you want to, to comment? Uh, yeah, thank you. I had a little bit trouble understanding Juli uh, now. Uh, was it only me or? I, I couldn't follow Juli all, all the answers. Okay, okay, cool. Then it was only me in the end. Okay. Um, no, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, in, in terms of the, the, the socialization of the, the final report, I think that it's, it, it will be probably a prob very difficult uh, thing because uh, the truth, truth, are all always uh, debatable and difficult commission has has to go and I think it will yeah it will be they will try to 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 find a balance um, among the various forms of truth and um, I just wanted to say that it, it already was a, a struggle for uh, many communities to, to socialize there the peace agreement uh, to to get the peace agreement to the communities and the results of the peace agreement um, because of lack of funding, uh, because of lack of instruments and so, so on. So the question is like, of course now it, it will be as, uh, as Julie said, uh, um, it, it need, there, there needs to be dialogue between the communities and, 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 and the final report. But I think it's, it's important to, to, to not commit the same uh, mistakes that there were in terms of the peace agreement and and have um, a more yeah thorough consideration of the funding process as well and um, and also I wanted to say that I mean we have already like many communities uh, or many organizations um, have sent their final reports uh, their, their their own reports uh, to the truth commission too. And I think it's uh, a, that is a very great um, um, input to understand the diversity of the stories that um, this Truth Commission also has to kind of to to merge and put together. And um, and I think I just wanted to give maybe one thing to um, as a, as a food for thought something that given that there are already these many reports that have sent um, these many organizations that have sent their own reports to the Truth Commission, where they have talked about their truth, um, be it uh, the organizations from St. Andrews or San Andres, or uh, be it um, uh, Onique, for example, has sent an, a report. Um, the Truth Commission kind of gives them 
the credibility so <laughs> that the truth that they say is actually true. And I think this is also a little bit problematic if we think about it, right? I mean, I don't, I don't want to get into this uh, huge discussion, but I think it's, 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 uh, it's something that we should reflect uh, as well um, about the authority to credit or not, to give or not credibility to um, the various uh, stories that are being told. And um, yeah, and finally, um, I think another question is just as important important as the question that you have made, uh, Nicole, and that is how do we make sure actually that um, the final report and the different chapters are actually um, read by the whole population and how do we make sure that these stories, these diverse truths get, for example, to Bogota. I mean, like, uh, for example, I think until today, lots of people don't know that there is an ethnic chapter within the Colombian Peace Agreement. And um, so they just skip the parts, uh, for example. So how do we make sure actually that, um, yeah, that uh, the, these, uh, these different truths also arrive in the urban centers, for example, that are not as affected? And how do we make sure that they are being socialized with the truth? Uh, with the final report. Okay, uh, I know that Claudia, you want to say something, I will give you the word, but I will also, because of time, the next two or three questions left, I would like you to be a little bit more precise. And then we will have a little bit more of time to, to discuss at the end some questions. So Claudia, you go, and then I go yeah. back to ask yeah, two I, questions more. I was wondering about two things, one, do you think communities already have those reports or they do not have them? I understood they have them. And I think it's very important that every community has the chance to read it and to find their own pain on that because those are reports of pain, of trouble, of trauma. And if we want to make not victims of trauma, but they repeat it, we have to make what uh, Julie was saying, social actors. We have to construct out of this situation of discussing together our pain, that you can see different forms and different kinds of reception of those pains, right? We can also see the way out of it. And this is very important because Natalia, you said women tend to victimize themselves. It, in, or you say, well, they say they are victim of that, victim of that, victim of, so I understood that. But in order to help women or men to get out of the position of the victims and to become actors of their own life, to become active and to fight for the rights, because it goes about rights, uh, we have to find the needs they have, the need they feel, and what produce those pains because they are not in pain anymore. But when they read the pain, when they remember about the pain, then they are able to talk about what they need to solve the pain, to get relief. And I think that is a political question also. There is a human dimension out of it. Do they, meet, do they need human rights? Are the human rights respected? Do they need education to communicate, to can read better, to, to understand papers, what do they need? Are their rights respected? Do they have a good health system? If they are very complicated with their tra traumas, can they have psychologists and doctors? And I, can, I think that we can discuss this at the level of communities, and that will be a great discussion. It's not free of pain, it's not free of difficulties, but I think that it will be a wonderful chance to make, um, or to open up possibilities to get something else out of violence and pain, to get relief and to get politics. <laughs> and those politics will be based about th those things we do not want to repeat again. We want to become political persons. We want to become or to fight for our rights through language and not through weapons. And I think I, I would like to leave it here, but I think that it's very, very important to make sure that we get those reports to the communities. Very, very important. 
and to let them talk about it, to give them time and to give space. I think Natalia, you want to make a, a short correction. Yeah, please, because I think there was a confusion there and I think okay. it helps us uh, clarify some things and then also talk about um, what this socialization process could mean. I think um, what I meant was not that uh, women feel like victims. I, th I, I was instead saying that the state by um, giving a category to understand this otherness, make them victims, victims of a lot of things and describing them as absent and of empty spaces that need to be intervened by doctors or policy or development strategies or whatever, you know? And that's why, why I think this socialization process of the, of the Truth Commission needs to go beyond the idea of victims and, and victimhood. Because if it does goes on with this idea, it could lead to another 20 or 30 or 50 years or so on of violence here. I think what we can get from this Truth uh, Commission report, it's, um, and I am hoping it to be, because I don't know yet, but I'm hoping it to be a metaphor of resistance, of resilience, of an idea of a nation that could uh, go beyond uh, these um, co armed conflict uh, story, you know, I think is that uh, metaphor of hope, of resistance, of resilience, of keeping on fighting for territory and land and bodies and justice and everything that everyone here is fighting for. I think if we tell that story and not a story of victim, victim, victimhood from the state, then we can do something else with this um, truth, you know, because I agree with Maria, there's, there's a lot of problems with the idea of truth, but it, still we can do a lot, politically, politically speaking, with this aspiration of truth. Now I am okay, okay. Natalia. Uh, Lorena, which is also part of the, you no, know, the, the Germany support group of the True Commission has, replying the chat to the question about if all the communities have the reports that not all the communities have them, but some have been able to interact with at least the testimonial volume, one of the chapters of the final report, and there will be a process of delivery and discussion. And I think that's where, when, when I when I posed the question, it was more on the sense that even though the true, true commissions rely a lot on oral, on, on oral sources, on testimonies, uh, at the end, they, they translate this into written statements because it might be easy for the state consumption and policy making to have a draft. But at the end we have to think, and I don't want to use now the socialization after what really made me aware, but we have to think ways of um, outreach and things of, uh, yeah, discuss these uh, written statements in, into different, more cultural appropriate ways. Uh, but I will continue with the next question. Uh, this is not addressed to someone specifically, but it's open to everyone who wants to answer. Who might be an essential ally in this important yet demanding process of implementing an intersectionality approach in the post-accord scenario, considering the end of the true commission mandate uh, that is going to happen soon. And for example, uh, and I will join that with the next question, uh, that we, we have this panel like academia, civil society as, as we imagine it. What can be, for example, the specific roles of academia, researchers, university students uh, in, in peace building or repetition and, and in the dissemination of, of this final draft on and in the future challenges that we will have to, to keep alive the legacy of the True Commission. I can say what I would like to do if I go to the communities with those reports. I would like to listen to them. I would like to listen to their needs, to what they have lost, for instance, in all the processes and they went through. 
the different kinds of violence they relate to when they listen to that uh, reports. If they say, no, I didn't never suffer that, then what did you suffer about? So that this report is the base of a dialogue with its starting and that we learn how to listen to them and what, what, what they really want to do when they have this report and when they ask their questions and um, they, what do they want to create? And how do we as uh, listeners and as uh, academics bring all this in a language, in, in reports that can guarantee that the rights are going to be real and not more expression of desires, for instance, but they find a channel where they can be become realities, institutionalized. I think that will be very, very important. And I would love to be as an academic or as a, somebody who is who um, is supporting women and ethnic uh, communities to be there and to listen to them. Thank you, Claudia. Natalia? Okay, well, um, as a teacher myself, I think, <laughs> I think an, an important ally are teachers everywhere, um, everywhere in the country. I think we need to design strategies to learn about what is, has happened in order um, for it to be an opportunity for something else. Uh, so I think this report could not be just a history book. This needs to be an educational tool to talk about our history and the future we can build upon it. For the role of academia, I think um, we as academics here and everywhere else in the world, because Colombia is kind of a study case everywhere. And I think we need to keep telling complex and better stories about Colombia. I think, um, um, there's no generalization or simplification or synthesis possible with this history. And yet this is how it's been told. So I think we need better science. We need more ethically and politically engaged production of knowledge that is relevant and just not simply not simplistic. We need a type of knowledge that understands the specific historic and geographic conditions and the relations it has with global and local phenomena. I think we need the type of science that doesn't expect to apply just another set of recommendation, even if it is, is the recommendations of the inter intersectionality approach or any other approach. I think um, we need to do better science than that. We need to tell better stories. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, Maria, do you want to say something about this question? Um, yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I mean, in terms of allies, um, um, well, when when Ana Maria told me about this ally question in the academia, and I was like, well, I don't think we should expect much from academia <laughs> saying this is an academic <laughs> because there the temporality is so different, and um, I think that also the 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 outreach of acad of the academy is is not what civil society would should hope for. Um, I think, um, to be honest, um, I think that um, in, that doesn't matter, that doesn't mean, however, that the academy should not um, try, that academia should not try to do their work. I think what we can do or what we should do is to use this um, knowledge or students, professors, so what should be their role is, or our role, is to, to think uh, about, to mirror the results of the truth um, of the final report with what we have learned so far and to look at the gaps that will arise between these two. And I think that can give us so much to, to think about and to learn about, um, especially for the academ academia. I think the academia can, can, can learn a lot from 
this report and I think needs to do their homework then, which then will take a couple of years and decades probably. Um, and the international community will learn a lot from this final report too. I think that that I think that's the way that I can I can understand. And then they finally will develop some I don't know instruments or whatever. Um, but um, and I, I mean another 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 uh, traditional ally would be uh, international community and donors, right? That are mo normally those who then would support uh, the Colombian state with the implementation process of and the socialization process of what we just talked about before and to make sure that um, um, yeah the different uh, lessons learned uh, lessons learned uh, get to the different regions in the country but I think for this um, I think also international community and whatever like United Nations UDP so on UNFPA whatever um, need to do also like take more seriously an intersectional approach but that would also I think need to take seriously the perspectives and the knowledge that is already there and so I think it it, it would be like a triangle between the lessons learned from the truth from the final report taking seriously who were the those who who spoke and who grant who gave contributed with that knowledge to this final report, because obviously the truth com commissions didn't write it, but they got this knowledge from the many conversations that you also mentioned in the beginning. And um, and for academia and international community um, to, to learn from this and to understand what this means uh, concretely in terms of instruments and implementation and how to take these people not only as receivers, of a program, of a project, but actually of those who, who started in the first place to, to, to share this, this knowledge and experience. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will conclude this space, um, like this section, <laughs> by saying that it's really interesting what we have discussed in this segment, not only in terms of yeah, socialization and dissemination or different ways of outreach and how we should contrast the final report and uh, bring leaders and bring the people and hear them, but also about the long process in this long roadway that we, we still have to do. And I, I do believe that like the academia has a lot a lot to say or even though yeah probably works in different times and a different and a different language that sometimes is like too high uh, and it's actually a, or sometimes even hard for us to understand so I can imagine for other people uh, there is still like the the university still remains as a, as a crucial actor in this tag to contribute to peace and I guess this is like the best example like, this forum that we are doing and using these concepts that might be sometimes so high but now we bring them into specific examples and make them easier to people to understand is one of the steps forward to it so we have now come to the last part of the panel and i will give the last word to daniela great um thank you for this insightful section of course um so we would like to engage the audience finally so you can, of course, um, ask questions by raising your virtual hand or just write them in the chat and we will post them. We ask you, however, to, to be a little bit precise because we're running out of time. And we also ask our panelists like very kindly if you can also give a rather brief answer so we can stick to, to the time. Um, if someone has like any trouble by like raising here or his hand, um, yeah, like speak out. I don't see any hands by now. But I'll just give you a um, couple of seconds. Oh, just just one second. Um,
So we have a question. Did you want to speak out, Lorena, or should I read the, the question if, if you prefer? So Lorena asks, um, since most of us live outside Colombia, how do we think, how do you think we can address this topic outside Colombia? And why is it important? So this question is not uh, for someone specifically, but whoever feels um, encouraged uh, and empowered to, to say something, um, uh, do so. I can say something very <laughs> sure. uh, <laughs> um, normal and what you can do is go to institutions that are working with it and get connected. It's very easy right now to get connected to Colombia, to people working on the truth commissions and so on and ask questions and ask them, what can you do to help your country or to help, I don't know, the communities that are involved in those processes. I think that there are lots of chances to get in touch. Uh, Juli, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think that as, as Claudia said before, um, just a few moments ago, um, I think it's important, uh, obviously, to try to get and gather the people because that's the first step. We need to get the people because um, they also need to understand um, the information. But also, I, was, I also will say that um, it's important to um, bring those non-political actors because this is the thing with the Colombian community first is that we need to understand that even when we are outside Colombia, we are Colombians. And it, that is pretty obvious, but I think it's not that really doesn't happen that often. Sometimes when we are outside Colombia, it doesn't feel that we are not interested in the, in the country, um, in the country topics. So we are just somehow neglected. And it, I think it's important to gather us in different ways, in different moments, and um, bring the topic together, be open to discuss, and also be open to have different reactions because that doesn't happen not just in communities. We have different roots, we have different um, situation. We came in different situation. Also, we have different time living outside the country. So it would be, um, I would say, a really interesting conversation or of dialogue. But I also, I would say that it's important to bring those actors that are not participating that much. And those are not easily connected, I would say. For instance, that, that people that we know that they are not really political, they don't really like to in, in be participate in political actions because they think that for any reason, but it's also to make them part of that because I think for sure they will have important um, opinions to give. So I think that that is also important. And also I think that it's important both in communities in Colombia, but also here with people outside Colombia, Colombian living abroad, it's important to have the feed, like get the feedback. Because I think that sometimes we don't think about this. I mean, yes, it's important to get the report, but it's also important to get the feedback. I mean, it has to be like bold ways conversation. And that's also important to acknowledge what the people is thinking about this. I mean, it won't change, it's already published. That is, I think it's important to the people know that we matter what you say, I think. Thank you for your answer. We, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I see you, Natalia, do, do you want to comment on that? If not, I can also pose the next question. So Kera says, or is she questions, what role does national media play in the distribution of the final report? Can it work as an interactive junction between academia and the people in Colombia? I see you. Uh, well, I can say something about this. Um, well, um, the role of national media is, is kind of complex, you know. Um, there are like mainstream media and mainstream media right now is kind of being a little bit um you know i i don't know uh, hostile to the truth commission itself because of its history and because of its um the the, the way it was um 
a forum and kind of a lot of different things that has happened uh, that have ha happened uh, recently uh, with one of the commissioners and 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 everything so mainstream media um is it's been very very hostile um right now and I think it, it, it has to do with, um, there's a, a, a lot of fear of what the truth uh, could, have, could end up being <laughs> in the end. And also uh, with the um, uh, mainstream powers, can, can, ha, how are they going to, you know, like be seen in this report? So I think mainstream media is not the place uh, that it could, be like this interactive junction between academia and people. Um, I think there are a lot of different other media that could do this part and could play this part. Uh, other media that um, right now are um, mobilizing other kind of um, uh, uh, strategies and messages and that, that have become very important in the country. Uh, since I think 2019 and the, 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 the strike and everything that has happened then, from then, uh, there's, there's been like a public reaction and a lot of different other um, media that ha have been like um, handing over different messages and uh, making a place for, the, for themselves and this invisibilizing uh, other kind of messages in Colombia. So I think there's a lot of, um, of, of play for them here and uh, for other kind of uh, organizations, uh, social organizations, cultural collectives and students and well, the, 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 the different kind of people that are um, in the past years, in the recent years, have been mobilizing and acting politi politically to um, diversify uh, the message of what has happened here or, and what's been going on since uh, the, the, the peace agreement in 2016. I think there are a lot of things that uh, have to be said and I don't believe that mainstream media are going to be the ones um, who say them, it. I don't know. Does anyone want to add on that or challenge that point of view in a particular way? Do we have um, any more questions from the audience? Okay, there we go. Uh, so, Andres asks Natalia specifically, from your experience as Bogota women <laughs> working with rural communities, do you have any tip or recommendation about how we could talk and create connections with communities? Well, this has been a challenge. Um, I'm, <laughs> I have a very urban life and so a lot of um, biases, you know. Uh, but uh, we've been working um, alongside um, different um, Organiz organizations and we've been working with an epistemological and methodological approach that challenges uh, uh, actually our, our point of view uh, in writing about uh, uh, these stories of uh, peasant women or rural women as, as they as they know it. Uh, so um, we've been we've been challenging our um, ideas that we have to interpret social and cultural realities. And we, we've been challenging the idea that we are the ones that need to tell the story, but still uh, we are trying to work from our privilege. We have this privilege, this, um, uh, this voice and this um, ability to um, speak in places that are known and that are public and that speak loudly about what's happening. So uh, we are trying to negotiate with that stance, with that place, with that 
weird place that has been that needs to be challenged, which is the academia uh, and its privilege. But also, uh, we need to occupy that space of privilege to try and say and promote other kind of um, ideas in academia. So uh, what we're trying to do is, is we are trying to bring uh, these um, organizations and these uh, collectives um, to the space uh, and to talk about um, the, the, the struggles and the things that, uh, that are going on in the rural communities, because most of the time when we, and I'm going to take uh, this uh, Juli's um, words about this, we, most of the time we are trying to help and that's nice, but most of the time that help isn't needed in the way we need, we think we, they need. So um, in my university, by instance, there's a lot of work, a lot of reflection, a lot of um, uh, ideas about how rural Colombia should look like and should be and should be intervened and what it should be uh, like to be a peasant in Colombia and how uh, their economic and political and everything uh, it should look like. And then there's a lot, uh, uh, there's very, very um, few dialogues with the people who are actually struggling to have another kind of uh, rural project for Colombia and another kind of, um, um, struggles that may not be aligned with what uh, we imagine development should look like. So um, we are trying to just uh, get to, to, to have these um, conversations, these dialogues in the university and also in other public spaces. So uh, we try to change the narrative of what we are talking about and the intentions that we have with these uh, different collectives. That's that's what we are working on. And I think that's what academia should um, start working on. This is not new in Colombia. We have been talking about horizontal methodologies for a long time, and <laughs> we have a lot of experience uh, on that. But still, uh, again, when talking about peace, when talking about development, most of the time, these um, methodologies just uh, end up being in the last uh, place of uh, priority. So I think that's what I would like to say about that. About that. Thank you. I see uh, Julie is raising her hand. Uh, is, it ex is it still um, your hand or was it uh, the past hand to the lower? Yeah, I just wanted to add, thank you, Natalia. I just wanted to add something on the top of that. And is I think that when uh, we work with communities, it's important to have I would rather say, is my point of view, that it think about cooperation and coordination and not think that we're just coming to bring um, the help, whatever it is. Um, but uh, thinking that we are cooperating and coordinating, that's also a really good perspective, is horizontal. But also I think it's important to have um, at least one people, uh, one person, sorry, or one organization that really knows the community because they are, way of doing the things and that is also important and I think that it's okay not to know it, the things because I mean when you are from another community that's okay you don't have to know everything but it's good when you understand that you don't know it and you call someone that can understand that community but also I think it's nice when the, the people that came from outside the communities don't pretend that they know it because that is very awkward for the community for both because we know that is you don't and, and also can feel like you are trying to confront us about the way we do stuff but that we know because we are community, but uh, they are just technicals, I would say. So yeah. um, thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for both of you. So we would like to just uh, grab up and um, finalize this event as we are running out of time. So that would be everything basically, uh, but some words that stick to, to my mind um, during the contributions uh, were uh, recognition, context sensitivity, ownership, agency, dialogue, hope, resistance, resilience. We could go on and on, but I think this board summarizes pretty much what you discussed and what we discussed in this in this discussion. 
uh, but um, and something I would like to, to um, end up with is uh, despite of the virtues of this concept of intersectionality, we have acknowledged there's plenty of things we still have to, to make um, to translate such an approach to, to, to something practical, like to, to action. And to bring this debate from academia to, to the actual communities that, um, yeah, that are protagonists of, of this whole process. So uh, what I would like to, to comment the, this, this last statement uh, in this last statement would be to, to overcome this somewhat paternalistic approach. We, we have talked about that several times um, in these two hours. Um, and both in knowledge production, so like epistemological, epistemologically speaking, but also when dealing with communities. So that's my final word. Uh, we also want to thank the German Colombian Peace Institute CAPAS and the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs with whom we have been working jointly since 2020 to support the, the Colombian uh, Truth Commission and um, its work uh, abroad and we would also have uh, just just make you aware again the final report of the truth commission will be released on june the 28th at 11 a.m colombian time and this report will be available in different presentations um and with uh, different strategies to and um, tools to facilitate its understanding both in colombia and of course abroad by colombian people and not colombian people of course uh, and we would like to extend you a very special and warm thanks um, to you, panelists of today. Thank you for your time, for your insights, um, for your contributions, and of course, our audience. Uh, and thank you very much for joining. And don't forget to follow us on our social media channels, which are, ah, okay, they're already uh, being posted. Uh, we post regular uh, information on these topics of the final report. Uh, we also have a podcast. Um, so thank you very much. And we hope to see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>